Helen Prejean to the heart of the death penalty controversy. Her groundbreaking work with death row inmates inspired her to write a book she called Dead Man Walking. Stay Helen, touch me. Yes, she may. Her story inspired a powerful feature film. Dead Man Walking! And now, an opera. I never dreamed I was going to get with death row inmates. I got involved with poor people. And then learned there was a direct track from being poor in this country and going to prison and going to death row. As the opera began to take shape, the death penalty debate claimed center stage in the news. I now favor a moratorium because I have grave concerns about our state's shameful record of convicting innocent people and putting them on death row. I've been asked this question a lot ever since Governor Ryan declared a moratorium in Illinois, and I, I, I don't believe we need one in Texas. And the reason why is I'm confident every person that's been put to death under our state has been guilty of the crime charged. The deepest moral question about the death penalty is not what to do about innocent people. We know we shouldn't be executing the innocent. What about somebody we know is really guilty and we execute them? I've always wanted to prove to everybody uh, that the opera is an art that can deal with any topic. And so I felt that it would be wonderful to approach the subject of capital punishment. Dead Man Walking would seek to reflect the grief and sense of loss of those so often captured in the headlines. As we follow the making of the opera, three of these individuals told us their stories. Our kids were the most nonviolent people I've ever known in my life, had this dreadful violence heaped upon them. The next car was my son, and he just drove on the right side of him and shot him. In my brother's last days, he wasn't even permitted to hug his mother in his last days without shackles. So to see an opera being done, which is gonna help people reflect on this, you know, is something that is, is deeply satisfying for me. So glad that this story can be told. When they do this thing to you, Sister Helen, I want you to look at Sister, me. I'm gonna Major funding for And Then One Night, The Making of Dead Man Walking, has been provided by the KQED Campaign for the Future Program Venture Fund, comprised of individuals, foundations, and corporations committed to the production and acquisition of quality programs, and by Mr. and Mrs. William R. Hewlett, with additional funding from Tony and Arthur Rock, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. October 7, 2000 was the culmination of an ambitious creative journey that spanned three years. Dead Man Walking promised to be a potent combination of art and controversy. This opera is dealing with a theme that has such national resonance right now. It was the subject matter that got us here. Well, I'm for capital punishment, he's against it, so we're kind of arguing that. Unfortunately, I'm on the fence. I'm not totally opposed to the death penalty either. I think it'll be interesting to see how the music world deals with that topic and what kind of, you know, discussion they, they give it musically. When I heard that they were going to do an opera, I thought, music can take us into places of our hearts we don't even know we have. And so what better way than through music uh, for this story?
Commissioning any new opera is a daunting task. Both with Dead Man Walking, Latvi Mansuri took an even greater risk. He selected a writer, a director, and a composer who'd never created an opera before. Jake Hagee was in our publicity department, and he started doing some uh, songs and song cycles for people like Frederick von Stade, and I felt that I wanted to take a chance with him. I'm unproven as an opera composer, and I know that. Latvi Mansouri said to me, well, you're writing all these songs that are being performed all over the world. Have you ever thought about writing an opera? I want to send you to New York to meet with Terence McNally, and uh, let's talk about which subject you're going to choose for your opera for this commission. I had been interested in Terence McNally for many years because Terence, number one, is a wonderful playwright, very theatrical. Uh, also, he loves opera. At that point, Lotfi had asked me to write a comedy, an adaptation of this French film called Les Belles de Nuit. Well, Terence could not have been less interested in this project. It was almost a year before I, one day, just walking down the street, the notion of gut, dead man walking uh, struck me. I said, that sounds wonderful. Uh, let's, let's look into that. That's how it started. Funding for the new opera was the first obstacle to overcome. Latvi Mansouri's enthusiasm brought San Francisco art patron Phyllis Wattis on board. It's a controversial subject, and I, ex I accepted it with great reluctance. Think of Phyllis Wattis coming up with $2 million to support a project by a composer she's never heard of and a subject she's not so sure about. But because Latvi's behind it and because the San Francisco Opera's behind it, she's going to trust. Even the tried and trues operas take a lot of money to produce. So it might just as well produce one that's new at the same time. People look forward to it. And uh, like many things, they hate it or they love it. It was summer, 1999. The libretto was complete and the score only missing the finale. A workshop was held to perform the opera for the first time over a year before the actual premiere. Resident San Francisco opera singers filled in for those members of the final cast who could not attend. I don't know that I could save Joe, but I'm there to comfort him. I write contemporary vernacular American English, and I said to Jake, this is how I write. Is that all right with you? I don't think people talk poetically in the situation these people find themselves in. It's the music that is going to add the dimension of the poetry. Can we stop for a sec? Sorry. Can we stop for a sec? Do you honestly feel that this? He's angry. My responsibility as the composer is to find the music that that person would sing. Now, someone like Joe Desrochers, our, our, our inmate, death row inmate in Dead Man Walking, um, it wasn't that easy to find. In casting uh, for the title role, I was in New York auditioning 35, 36 baritones. Everybody hear that? What is for? Joseph's gonna die for his sins. And then when this young man, John Packer, came on stage, started to sing, I said, that's him. You've been so good to him and all of us. I can never repay you. And of course, to have Frederica von Strade to play the mother, that's such a wonderful luxury. He's a good boy, he's your son. You see it too, don't you, sister? Here's a woman who has really no control over what's happened to her children, and that's something that affects every parent and at some point, and it was something that I just wanted to explore.
then, of course, uh, I had to go through all sorts of song and dance to free Susan Graham from a commitment at the Paris Opera. It's always tricky when you're portraying a living person. Sister Helen's got a great sense of spirit and spunkiness and, and sense of humor and sarcasm and wit. I saw Elvis Presley. Elvis. No, really, I wanted to be him. Her personality is bigger than the whole outdoors. big break. The music fits me. It even fits me better now that we're here in this workshop. And we are working through the music with Jake and Patrick Summers and all of us contributing our ideas. This doesn't happen very often. Uh, the fact that San Francisco is taking the time to really make sure that this is a collaboration and a very strong work. In the 18th and 19th century, the public was interested in new works. The public wasn't particularly interested in the music of the past, living in the moment. That's the greatest thing music has taught me. So what better way than to, than to have compositions that are right out of our own time, and even in this country, right out of the American vernacular? Question, but um, Christ said, don't give me Christ, but um, give me Helen Prejean. We better do that again. The conductor is the representative of the composer in that moment. So it is a much more collaborative and interesting process when the composer is there next to you. write other than as himself. It's direct and honest, makes an incredible emotional impact on first hearing. It is tuneful, it's intellectual, it's, it's the coming together of a lot of elements in modern music. In the first act of the opera, that scene where the parents express their grief and their loss, that big ensemble, that is the whole point of the story, which is this man has taken away these children from these parents, and it's a loss that will never, ever, it's a hole that will never, ever be filled, ever. Opera is so much about the past, and here we're in something that is blatantly current. I mean, it's a political issue, it's, it's a daily issue, it's part of our lives. On April 19th, 1974, a man broke into our son's house, took our daughter-in-law downstairs at Knife Point, had her tie our son to a chair where he was beaten to death, with a breadboard and a claw hammer. Annette was taken upstairs and was violated sexually and physically for six hours. He did unspeakable things to, to her. And when he left, he set both of them and the house on fire. And that's what happened to Annette and Frank.
Betty Carlson's daughter-in-law, Annette, miraculously survived and identified the killer. He was sentenced to death, but in 1976, California briefly banned the death penalty. At that time, a life sentence without parole was not possible. To date, Betty Carlson has testified at nine parole hearings of her son's killer, pleading that he remain in prison. He beat Frank Carlson's brains out of his head. The fact that this lives with me for days and weeks following the parole hearing, I think is unconscionable. And we should not, none of the victims should have to experience this again. still waiting for him to walk in that door. William August's son was murdered in 1989. My son was returning home one night. There was a guy on the freeway that uh, was attempting to shoot other people. Raymond August was one of several victims shot and killed at random that night. And my wife come in and asked me what, what had happened. Because you know I left, but I didn't come home to tell her. I didn't even know how to tell her that. And then I just finally said, we lost our son. You know, and that was just so, and we just sit right there in the dark. <laughs> Well, there was a trial, and he was convicted and sentenced to death penalty. I would doubt that I see him executed. He's number 300 and something on death row. I just want to see him punished for his crime, but I would give him up if I could get my son back. I tried to write this from the point of view of Sister Helen and of the parents and of the prisoner. I think the place that Sister Helen has ended up is a very difficult one for most of us to reach. I believe the death penalty is the appropriate punishment for certain types of crimes. Uh, they're just so horrible that uh, you just can't imagine uh, what it does to you know, the family of the surviving family members and, uh, and the community as a whole. The death penalty is not a socially acceptable answer. It's not even a personally acceptable answer. Killing in order to prove that killing is wrong is inherently contradictory. I think it's so easy to talk about capital punishment in an abstract way. I'm against it. I'm for it. I think it's very difficult to know how you really feel about it when it's more personal. What's so busy with that monster who killed my boy? I've always been, as far as I can remember, opposed to the death penalty. So it's been very funny for me to be one of the characters that the audience um, sort of identifies with as a, as a spokesman, if not for the death penalty, certainly for victims' rights. When Jake was first, when we were first talking about this project, I said, oh, I mean, I can't imagine if that was my son. And he said, well, yeah, but what if it was your son that killed the kids? Would you want him to die? I suspected my brother of doing this crime, and I knew that I had to take action. I had to get him off the street. When an elderly woman died after a robbery and beating, Bill Babbitt turned in his brother Manny, a troubled Vietnam veteran. The police promised that his brother would receive treatment in prison. Instead, he was sentenced to death. Then I had to go back to my family, go back to my mother and say, uh, they're going to try to kill Manny. They want to kill Manny. I abhor what Joe did, but do we deserve to kill him? 
answer my question. <laughs> Christ, sir. Joan, give me Christ. <laughs> give me Helen Prejean. <laughs> There is deep conflict, of course, in my experiences with death row inmates on the one hand and victims' families on the other, and how to bridge that between the two. You'll see him go out the door. you see him walk out the door. Date and the last words you see Come your hands, your blows. Shut the door. He's gone. He's gone. I'm sorry. True art, I think, brings you over to both sides of a conflict. And all you do is just bring people there. Shut the door. all wound up on stage singing the same music because in a way they're all dealing with the same issue <laughs> having lost a child about to lose a child you know dealing with that pain The very private workshop performance of Dead Man Walking was followed by elation and relief. What this showed us is that we have a, we have the grand architecture of it already, which is the hardest thing to achieve. That was good. <laughs> this to me is kind of the most important day in many ways. This is when the opera was born. Next year it'll be shown around one year old with its you know, first suit, <laughs> beginning to walk. But today was, a, today was the birth. For Joe DeRocher, um, I had a little meeting with John about his hair, John Packard, and he is going to be able to grow it this long mm -hmm. and have that one of those sort of, I call it hockey hair. Uh, oh, yeah, Joe yeah. calls it a mullet. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it's this style of shirt we want for him, regular Actually, yeah. that's the way that uh, Packard looks, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit like that. When you work on a new work that's based on anything that's even remotely historical, it gets a little more mm, tricky because there's so much material around that everyone can access. Uh, they can read the book, they can see the movie. We're actually not going to use these actual tattoos, but mm -hmm. I think the layout of yeah, where they are yeah, is good yeah. for when he's doing his push-ups. Right, right. But we want to make sure we get this one in because that's mm -hmm. Aryan Nations. And they're actually going to be pretty much like tattoos done in prison, which is done not too well mm -hmm. because they have very bad Cheap, equipment because yeah. it's all illegal. Right. One night, a cold bottle of beer down by the river with your mama. A little side of gold drifting down from the road house. You lay a hail on her breast and she tells you everything is gonna be alright. Everything is gonna be
John Packard is very clear with his character. He'd taken a trip to Angola, and he'd seen death row. He'd been on the car ride out there, and I think it deeply, deeply affected him and his idea of the character. You can read a lot of books about prisons, watch movies, but when they called me and said they have an opportunity to come down here to the actual prison, and that's something that I think I have to experience. Morning. There are no soft sounds in prison. It's all cement floors, bars, people yelling, voices reverberating. I'm going to try to feel like what these guys go through. Every time he is out of his cell, he is in manacles. No control. Trapped. difficult thing about this role. To support the intensity of the characters, the designers had to capture the emotional truth of the settings. That it's the guards bring on two chairs, and they're just in like separate pools of light, and they can sing out just as we set up in yeah, the first sure. scene. Without any kind of a realistic conversation. No, which is the, good. I, I like yeah. that. I and like that. The most difficult thing with uh, an opera as intimate as this one is, is the fact that you do have a large stage to deal with. I see it very, very simple and very stark. The very first piece we had, we checked it and everything, and we ended up moving it three quarters of an inch, or else the elevator went to work. When we do a show that we've already done, we can basically come here and bang it up. This is definitely more difficult. This went together pretty well this morning. And there's nothing to say that things won't move as soon as the designer and the director see it on the stage. This is the this moment when this red Coke machine comes in. It's really kind of the only color that we've really seen in the whole evening. And it takes on this kind of whole hallucination. You see the inmates, All of he's the also episode. putting the dead, the murdered children in the boxes, uh -huh. he's got the family in the boxes. Yes. Her different totally. visions exactly. of that. Exactly. No, it's very strong yeah. to get that hallucination. That's right. So maybe let's change, if we can have somebody changing, let's change 70 and 73. Okay. We thought no. about putting fluorescents in the boxes, in each cell. And it just seemed like, first of all, that it wouldn't work very well. Second of all, that it would be hard to mask it. And so Michael Jurgen and I said, well, it should just be a silhouette. In a sense, that established a theme that was used throughout the piece. Slashes and um, silhouettes, and I would say cold light, and also the use of the boxes. We can accumulate all of those images and surround her with them. Almost like they're on a Ferris wheel going around her or something. The whole thing is overwhelming for her. The designers and performers knew the opera world well. 
However, director Joe Mantello, a veteran of Broadway and Off-Broadway, had never directed an opera before. I remember running around the opera house uh, saying to anyone who would listen, now you know I don't read music, I know nothing about music, I don't know, I, I have no vocabulary for music, and I kept being reassured that this was going to be fine and that there were people there that were going to get me through this. It, and it was a year away, so it was abstract enough that I could... <laughs> and I think I just put it out of my head until the day that I got to San Francisco and I actually had to walk into the room. And I remember being on the phone with a friend of mine going, I've made a really bad mistake. <laughs> there are 60 people waiting in a room. And you know, the one thing that I do know is that performers smell fear on the director. <laughs> when Joe Mantello and the principal singers began rehearsal, it was only one month before the premiere. They set out to bring together two worlds, theater and opera to create a new work of art. Joe Mantello is very concerned with realism and a very natural approach. In order to do that, we have to cut away a lot of traditional operatic grandeur, and we have to be very pure. Even though these are bigger than life issues and bigger than life emotions, our delivery of them has to be very straightforward. Hate it when you sound like a nun. Forget that I'm a nun. I hate it when you freaking sound like a nun. And then they come in, and then they start to get into a, a sort of a rhythm with the truth of set you free. This, you know, Joe. So didn't come with all of that heavy, stuffy opera stuff. You know, he he uh, really gave a lot of room for personal interpretation. I liked the simplicity of the way he worked. That seemed right for this particular piece. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Early on, maybe the second day, I was watching John, and he was sort of um, doing all of this stuff to let the audience know that, he, that this was a bad man, but it actually had nothing to do with John himself. And I said, there's something that's stopping you. I feel like he, he, he's not real to you. He's, 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 he's a type. He exists in the abstract to you. And I think you have to locate yourself in him somehow and embrace, you know, what's human about him and show us what's repellent about him and let us make up our minds. Okay, so you're, instead of, instead of John being right, John, I'm a little, I'm a little bit curious. To me, a new play, and I think a new opera even more, is like trying to grow an orchid in Alaska. You know, they're <laughs> very, very delicate. And you really do need the right team. And if you don't have that chemistry, I don't think a new piece succeeds. I'll show you one second. I just want to look at this pose for me. I think she would. If I were her, I'd put myself next to Joe. Okay. okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, gather around me, boys. Yeah, what I'm looking for is for someone to sort of be... Right now it's a line. And yeah. Just, just if you... No, you let, let, put him in front. I'll put him yeah. in front. That's good. That's okay. good. That's good. That's good. Okay. That's much better. Okay. It's so close to me, you know. I have kids and I'm playing my own age. That was the part I wanted to play because, I mean, the worst thing that's asked of any parent is to lose a child in any way. But one step worse is to feel that you are responsible in some way for your child's fate, you know. with Flicka Van Stada, she was telling me which musical and, and vocal lines to her defined her character. She goes, 
there it is, right there. It's in the first scene that she has, the pardon board hearing, where she says, I just don't know what good my Joe's being dead will do. My brother was a person who served two tours of duty in Vietnam, suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, saw five major campaigns in Vietnam, was awarded the Purple Heart in shackles at San Quentin Prison. And we were looking for clemency for Manny, and that clemency meant life in prison without possibility of parole. I personally don't think life in pr prison is enough for this type of crime. Why should you spend the rest of your life whether it's in prison or outside of prison, alive, when you just have taken a number of lives. I feel it's very valid to play the point of view of a person in that position, because I don't know how I'd feel if somebody killed my kid. I might want him dead. Most of the guys who get a death penalty have been down the block once or twice before, and they got a, you know, an escalating pattern of criminality. So, you know, I mean, they've had their chances with uh, prison, and it hasn't worked. He's fed, he's clothed, he's housed, he has medical care. Um, not so bad. The thing that stays with me is that he's alive and Frank is dead. And that doesn't change. If I were Stanker's father, I'd hate my boy too. The victim's families are being treated like pariahs on one end of the spectrum. Death row inmates are treated like pariahs on the other end. People are staying away from both. to do is to leave people isolated because then they really do collapse they can't heal I'm not sure what this man will face in eternity but Bottom line, I would rather be Frank's mother than his mother. Doing a new work and attending the premiere performance is like looking at a, a novel in, in galley, that it's the first time you're really looking at it. You can't proofread it. Um, it's not performed time after time in an empty theater or in previews the way a Broadway show is performed. Joe and I, who have spent our lives working in the theater, we're used to previews for like weeks, getting it right. Operas are basically shot out of the cannon at the audience. And yeah. <laughs> I'd like to go back, please, and try that one more time. As the premiere drew close, the eyes of the opera world turned to San Francisco. So we could we reset that, please, at the very end of the... Oh, the premiere performance was already sold out. 
and public expectations were running high, the cast was deep in rehearsal. I'd say the biggest challenge has been actually in the amount of time we've had on stage. Stop, please. Stop, please. Stop, please. I kept having people come up to me and saying, why aren't you just running this? Why aren't you just running the show? Oh, please. Stop, please. We've just gotten onto the stage. This is our first time trying this. Can we just hold one second, Patrick? I'm sorry. This rehearsal's always agony for me because we never get to do more than 10 bars of music, but that's, you know, that's what this rehearsal's like. Okay, good. Well, there's 27 scenes, and you have to routine it, and it's been rather difficult because it, it has elevators, things going up and down, and all has to be timed to the music. Lights 265, go. I always say that if I end up by getting 50% what I hoped for at the beginning, I think I'm doing very well. That doesn't work, this works. It's, it's very intense that way. But it's especially intense because the characters are so intense. With Helen, every single scene that we do is a different flavor, a different color, a different moment, but they're very intense. on stage nearly the whole time. It's not an easy role. It's not an easy opera. It's not easy to go there emotionally. And quite frankly, it's daunting. Help me to be strong, sister. Help me to forgive him. The bedroom scene is a really special moment. And actually, from Helen, it's the turning point uh, where she gets to the other side of forgiveness. It's just about two good friends sitting up late at night just talking about a really tricky subject, personal forgiveness. Forgiveness comes in many forms. Forgiveness can be something as simple as, you know, the touch of a hand or a look in the eye. Forgiveness is a monumental step that I still have to take. I come closer to it but I haven't completely reached it. I asked my brother, uh, during, before he was arraigned for murder, I says, Manny, I'm sorry, but we're going to get you the help he needed. I said, please forgive me, brother. He said to me, brother, all is forgiven. So that was my first taste of forgiveness right there. I could never forgive him. I could never forget and I could never forgive him. And I have seen parents who have been able to do that, and I have not been able to bring myself to that stage. I know my pain is about my child's death, not his death. But I'm stuck with who I am and how I feel. When they say, I can't forgive, a lot of times, because they're dealing with so much, they only have their anger in the beginning to keep them going. Because they'd commit suicide. They'd implode from the sorrow and the grief. Everyone's sorry. Everyone's sorry. Everyone's sorry. If a man deserves to be executed and face his demons, it is Manuel Babbitt. 
We have waited 18 years for justice to prevail. The time has come for his life to end. Abbott beat my mother to death. He beat to death a little old lady, not a Vietnam adversary has been contended. If somebody killed my mother, somebody killed my loved one, I might be standing right where you are because you've lost someone, you know? The ones who help them get through are other people who have been through that same journey themselves. They are the only ones who can talk to them about making the journey out of the other side. If I were in a room with the prisoner and he was confined by chain or whatever to a chair and my choice of weapons was on a table and I had an opportunity to terminate his life, I couldn't do it. So why should I ask society to do something for me that I cannot do for myself? The, uh, the criminal who was facing the death penalty has declared war on society, and I think it's the society's ways of, uh, of payback. It's strict punishment, nothing else. Most advanced nations in the world, with the exceptions, sort of sparse and frustrating exception of the United States, have given up the death penalty um, because they understand that it doesn't serve any social purpose. I have never wanted this man's life. I just don't want him out. I was shocked when, when we realized that my brother's time was running out and that the governor was not going to grant clemency because he was worried about closure for the other victim. Let me look at you, see, I smile. This doesn't just affect the perpetrator and the victim. It's like a pebble in a pool. You drop a pebble and all the concentric circles come beyond that pebble. It touches everybody's life. And you can choose to let it color your life with bitterness and unhappiness, or it can color your life with good things that you can do to help others so that perhaps it won't happen again. That's what we've tried to do. face it, jurors aren't really enamored of sentencing somebody to death. And I would really, really hate to have to be the one to be put in that position. But if I'm selected, I'd hate to do it. But if the evidence is there, I will go and do it. How can we put this God job on people that only have human consciousness and wisdom and all the frailties? I want to get the word out about the pain. Ask anybody about the pain. Stop and think about, about the pain. This could happen to you. It could be someone you know, someone you love. You better hope they're not black. You better hope they're not poor. You hear?
as we approached the door to the death chamber, we had to walk through a gauntlet of correctional officers, and I saw compassion and hurt in their eyes. And I wanted them to know that my family forgives them for being a part of this murder. Just like I'm an accomplice to my brother's demise. Proceed. <laughs> the execution and the opera is done in complete silence. An opera. It's the only way fully you can attend to the reality of what is going on, that a human being is being killed in front of your eyes. What this experience is about, and the reflection that it leads to, is to look at different options. Is it the only thing we can do? To imitate the worst possible behavior of people who kill, and to say justice demands that we kill you? Is that the only thing we can do as a society? Are there alternatives? Art helps us explore alternatives, to make new choices, and brings us to that deeper place to do that. Make me strong, make me wise, make me... deeper by visiting PBS online. There you'll learn more about Sister Helen Prejean, the families, and the artists, and challenge your own views on the death penalty at pbs.org. Coming up next, stay with us for an hour of great conversation on Charlie Rose, and be sure to join us on Friday night for the premiere of Now with Bill Moyers. Explore the issues, people, and events that shape our changing world with Bill Moyers and NPR journalists. Friday night at 9 o'clock here on 13. Member-supported television that informs and entertains. Major funding for And Then One Night, The Making of Dead Man Walking, has been provided by...